Today is Tuesday, 1 September 2009. We are at the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? My name is Gene A. Phillips, Jr. <clears throat> My birth date is uh, March 25th, 1948, and I was born and raised in Saratoga Springs, New York. And uh, you attended school in Saratoga Springs? I attended Saratoga High. <clears throat> I was the first graduating half class or class of Saratoga High when they built the new school. Mm -hmm. And what year did you graduate? I graduated in 1966. And did you go on to college at that point? I went to Cobleskill Ag and Tech School for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I left Cobble skill to join the Marines. So you enlisted, you, you weren't drafted? Right. And why did you pick the Marines? I went down to Albany to see what, what was offered in all the branches of, of service except the Coast Guard. My father was in the Navy, he was mm -hmm. a chief yeoman. And I started with the Navy and the least amount of time I could get was three years. <clears throat> And I didn't want to serve three years. I wanted to start with I wanted to start with two if I could. Mm -hmm. So I come out of the Navy's office, and I happen to see uh, one of those sandwich boards in front of the Marine Corps recruiting office, and it said, "Try our new two-year en enlistment." They were also dra I believe they were I believe the the Marines were drafting at that time mm -hmm. too. But anyway, it said try our new two-year enlistment, so I thought that might be interesting. So I went and talked to the recruiter, and long story short, he was very honest with me, and he said, if you go in for two years, you're pretty much guaranteed you're going to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I can always try it for two years. If I like it, I can always ask for more time, but I don't want to sign up for any more time at this point. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And where did you go for your basic training? I went to Paris Island, South Carolina, good old Paris Island. Mm -hmm. and, and when did you go? I went in February, I believe it was February. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there 10 weeks and graduated April 15th. Uh, 1968, I guess it would be. Now, what was basic training like for you? Was it pretty rough down there? Basic training in the Marine Corps, of course, I can't compare it to anything else, but mm -hmm. um, it was it was it was hard. But if you were used to or could run, mm -hmm. and if you were reasonably physically fit, which I was at. 19 years old, I think I was when I went in. Um, you could get through it as long as you weren't a wise guy and you did what they told you to do. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what I did. Uh, when I went in, I could do, I think, 15 push-ups, and when I came out, I could do 70. Mm -hmm. um, Pull-ups were very hard for me because I don't have real, real... My strength isn't in my arms, it's, it's below my waist and my uh -huh. legs. But I was always a good runner. I was on the track team when I was in, in high school. And they ran everywhere mm -hmm. with packs, with rifles, with, you know what I mean? All, most of the exercise was usually running. And I did well. And what, what kind of rifle did you carry? Uh, I trained with an M14. Mm -hmm. And we trained all the way through infantry training, ITR at Camp Lejeune. Okay, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Is that where you went after? Yes, after, okay. after basic training in Paris Island, we went to school, mm -hmm. which I was trained in. Um, I was a combat engineer, shore party engineer, which we got the same training as the combat engineers, only we did a little bit more having to do with a beach landing. That's what shore party does. They in a in a traditional war where you hit the beach, 
once the infantry goes in, secures the beach, and moves ahead, Shore Party comes in, sets up the, the beach, and puts up these big banners so the ships out, out to sea know if they're carrying ammunition or food or water or gasoline or whatever they have, they know where they have to send that on the beach. It's all set up for them. Okay. And that's what, what we would do in the basic war, but Vietnam wasn't a basic, uh, wasn't a basic war, so what we were trained in was helicopter support teams. Now, how long was that schooling? That schooling was a month, I believe. Mm -hmm. A month, yeah. And we were trained in explosives, mine detection, that was the combat engineer part. Mm -hmm. And then, then we got into helicopter support team and uh, bridge building and road building and um, that, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. which we, you know, we could do if called upon. Okay. Especially mine detecting. Did you uh, get any leave time before you went to Vietnam? Uh, yes. Before, after, after school, then we went to infantry training. We thought, we were told through the grapevine that we were going right after boot camp, we were going to go home for 30 days. But that didn't happen and mm -hmm. we were really disappointed. But we went to infantry training, or we went to school right after boot camp, then ITR, infantry training, and then after ITR, then we went home mm -hmm. for 30 days, I think it was. And then when we left, when I left home, we were going to Camp Pendleton for more training. Mm -hmm. And that's... Pendleton's out in California, right? Camp Pendleton is in uh, near Ocean City. Mm -hmm. and San Diego okay. and we spent um, I believe it was almost a month there training and I think we started training with the M16 there okay that's and one now the training you went through there did you go through with the, the unit you went to school with through uh, through ITR training was was it the same guys or yes group? Okay. yes yeah okay so you went through that training? Yeah, we went through that training and then we were off to... From there, we, we, we left from Norton Air Force Base in California and got on a Continental jet. Mm -hmm. We landed in Hawaii and we refueled and then we took off from there and, and landed in Guam and we refueled again and then we landed in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. We spent about two or three days in Okinawa regrouping or whatever to get enough people and then we took um, another continental jet from Okinawa to Vietnam, Da Nang we landed in. Okay. What was your impression of Vietnam when you stepped off the, the plane? Amazed. Uh -huh. It was like sticking your head into a pizza oven. That's the only, that's the only thing I can tell you. Mm -hmm. It was so, so hot and humid. Mm -hmm. And the smell of, I don't know if you've ever been down south in the Carolinas, but you get that rotten vegetation, sort of moldy, mm -hmm. musty kind of smell. And it was like three times as bad mm -hmm. in Vietnam. It just, you, you knew you weren't in Kansas anymore. Uh -huh. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> did you go to any sort of replacement center or anything in Da Nang or right, right to, to the unit you'd be assigned to? We, we landed in Da Nang, I want to say it was around 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we had somebody come on the plane, it was a sergeant, and he told us where all the, the uh, bunkers were that we could jump into if we had to. And, pretty much scared the hell out of us. Yeah. And uh, if there was any incoming rockets or, or whatever, you know, all I wanted to know was where's the mess tent? I was starved, mm -hmm. you know? So we made our way, got off the plane, went to the mess tent, and we had our breakfast, and uh, we had our orders. We, just to back up for a minute, when we left California, they gave us our, our orders. We had our orders with us on the planes. And when we got to Vietnam, 
we, we knew where we were going. So we had to turn our orders in, they got stamped and everything, and we, after breakfast, then we went to uh, Da Nang, or out of Da Nang, caught a C-130 to uh, Dong Ha, I think it was. Because mm -hmm. that's where one of the, I don't know if Quang Tree had an airport now that I think about it. I think it was in Dong Ha. And we went there and then I would, then we caught a six by or something to uh, Quang Tree, mm -hmm. where my Alpha Company 3rd Show Party Battalion was located. Okay. And we checked in. What were the living facilities like in Quang Tree? We were living in tents when I got there. They were living in tents mm -hmm. when I got there. They slept about maybe, I don't know, maybe 12 guys, 10, 12, whatever. Mm -hmm. And after I was there for maybe a week or two, the CBs came in and they started building wooden screen hooches with metal roofs and they put up about one a day. Mm -hmm. And so as they put them out or up, we tore down a tent whenever you know we were ready to move in and, and we just moved all of our gear into these mm -hmm. huts which which were very nice yeah. compared to living in a in a tent that was like dark brown color with the sun beating at it. Mm -hmm. you know? These tents had, or these hooches that they built had uh, corrugated metal roofs with screens yep. all, all around. And it was nice, kept you dry. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't have to worry about any leaks in the tent. Or, so it was nice, you know, as nice as it could be. Mm -hmm. And uh, how big was the unit you were with? Was it like a company-sized unit? Yes. Yes, I'm not exactly sure how many people we had, mm -hmm. but um, it, the, you know, we we had we had a Radio Shack, we had mess a mess tent, we mm -hmm. you know we had a, a small little place where you could watch movies at night, um, a basketball hoop, mm -hmm. you know, for some exercise. We and eventually the CBs built us a shower where they used 55 gallon drums every morning somebody had to fill them with water uh -huh. and the sun would heat them up and then at the end of the day you, you could take a shower which was really nice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, what sort of missions did you run out of there? We would get we would get called for helicopter support teams so we used to do a, a lot of our work with 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, which, which was located at uh, um, LZ Stud, which was also named Vandergrift. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines was real close there, and we would have to report to them. And they would, um, they would put us with a company or two, depending on what was going out into the bush with the operation. They didn't tell us much. They just said, you're going to be with Alpha Company, or you're going to be with Bravo, or Charlie, or Delta, or whatever. We didn't know if it was a real big operation. The only way you could figure that out is how many companies were going. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't tell you where, where you were going, what they were going to run into, or, you know, everything was very hush-hush. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the biggest kicks I got out of it was when you were, when, once you got there, they had all picnic tables lined up and full of all kinds of ammunition. Anything that you needed, you just helped yourself. Hand grenades, M16 rounds, clips. Now you were issued an M16? Yes, we were at, issued a rifle and, and one or two clips or whatever it was, but any kind of ammo, any kind of hand grenades you wanted to carry, you could, if you wanted to carry 50 hand grenades, help yourself, mm -hmm. but you weren't allowed to they were pretty heavy, they were about a pound a piece, so yeah. if you decided after you got, got humping in the, in the jungle that it was too heavy for you to carry, you weren't allowed to just toss them. Mm -hmm. And, and if, you, if, you, if you took them in, you humped, you humped them in and you humped them out. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was kind of like a supermarket of, of war, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> kind of, sort of. All right, and what was your first encounter with the enemy like? My first encounter with the enemy was I jumped out of, out of a chopper that was hovering maybe 
five, six feet off the ground into grass, which I thought was only this tall, and it was like this tall. Mm -hmm. It was huge, and I thought my feet were going to hit the ground a little bit sooner than they did, and, and it jarred me pretty good. You know, I had a pack on and sure. all the rest of the gear. And uh, there was no problem coming in, but as we were walking in, after we were walking maybe 20 minutes, half an hour or so, in single file down this trail, there was a big ravine on our right-hand side, and I don't know what came in there, either an RPG or a mortar or whatever it was, and I just couldn't lay down flat enough. Mm -hmm. I felt like my butt was as big as a refrigerator with a target on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was pretty scary, but it was very exciting too. Mm -hmm. I mean, your heart was pounding and, and you, were, you were scared, but with me, I was scared and excited too. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to see what was going on. And then we heard some gunfire way up in the front of the, of the line of, of men and uh, somebody came back uh, wounded so we had to help that person get on the chopper because that was our job, uh -huh. and uh, that was kind of scary because we didn't, you know, we heard the, the the gunfire, but we didn't know if it was ours or theirs. You know, after a while, you you can distinguish between the M16 and the AK. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And uh, at that particular time, I didn't know the difference, and that was kind of scary because you already saw somebody get wounded. You know, so then we thought maybe we were running into some really bad problems, but the rest of the operation went very smooth. Other than later on, within a day or so, as we were walking, we, we could smell something really bad, really, really bad. And everybody was talking about it smelled like a dead body. So we figured it was probably a goo that had been killed. And come to find out, it was a dead dog that one of the uh, German shepherds that they use uh, must have been there. God only knows, you know. It, had, no. it couldn't have been too long before we were there because it so was, it was a scout dog that was yeah, shot. Yeah, that's what it looked like. I don't yeah. think I don't think the the gooks had yeah. any dogs that I that I remember. No. But, and he was, you know, he was, there was all flies and everything and maggots yeah. and everything all over, but that was the smell that was carrying through, the, you know, through the jungle. And that was pretty disgusting. Mm -hmm. But at least we found out what it was. Yeah. <clears throat> now, uh, how were you resupplied while you were out there? Did, did you carry enough food and water? Or were they bringing it into you? Well, both. We, we always carried, they, they told me, because it was my first operation, to bring at least a couple of days' worth of, of chow with me, mm -hmm. and at least four, four or five canteens of water full. You never walk in the jungle with a half full canteen, it makes too much noise. And uh, no radios, of course, mm -hmm. you know, because we heard stories about people actually bringing transistor radios out in the jungle and uh, you know you just can't do that you try to make as less noise as you can yeah. and um, any other resupply we got through uh, finding a clearing in the jungle and if we could get choppers in there they would bring us what we needed uh, medical uh, medical stuff ammunition, water, sea rations, whatever that, that they order. Okay, and, and how long did that mission last? Just a few days, or were you out there for, for I would say day? a few days. That was, was like maybe four days, I think. And then did you go back to Quang uh, Tree after that mission? Yes. Well, we flew back to Vandergrift, mm -hmm. and, and then we just reversed. We, we caught a ride from Vandergrift to back to Quang Tree, mm -hmm. which wasn't too far. It was like maybe, I don't know, I, I think I remember maybe a half an hour drive mm -hmm. down the dirt road. You know. And approximately how often did you go out on these missions? You could go out 
a couple times a week mm -hmm. and stay out maybe for two or three days or a week, uh, it varied. Mm -hmm. If you were going to a fire base, usually longer. I did a lot of fire bases. And do, you they, want, do you want to tell us about your work on the fire bases? Okay. Uh, um, do you want me to explain what a fire base is? Sure. Okay. A, a fire base basically is an advantageous point in the jungle that they're going to put artillery and uh, 60 millimeter mortar and 81 millimeter mortars so they can help or support the grunts as they're going on an operation in a certain area. Mm -hmm. So they put they, they pick a location so this fire base can support them with with artillery and all this other stuff uh, easily. Mm -hmm. And they they have to bring in the the howitzers, they bring them in with with choppers or a crane if they're if they're one fifty fives or something. The one oh fives they could usually bring in with the with the army choppers, because mm -hmm. they could lift a little more. And they, they even bring in like a small uh, bulldozer kind of thing, like a little bear cat or mm -hmm. what they call them today, and, and make flat areas so they can set these guns and they come in with the choppers and just set them down. And then the, the, the grunts and everybody builds sandbags around them and sets in, you know, to, for a, like a permanent base sort of permanent, not, mm -hmm. you know, for as long as the operation is going to last. And usually the fire base has lasted at least three weeks to a month, sometimes up to three months I've spent. And uh, we would maintain, you know, at every fire base had a landing zone, a lot of choppers coming in and out, a lot of big wigs coming in and out, high officers, depending on how big the operation was. Mm -hmm. I, I was on one where there was a a two-star general coming in at least twice a week to to meet with a full bird colonel who was in charge of the operation and he would come in at least two or three times a week on our landing zone and uh, they, they built a, a sandbag hooch for him and everything you know mm -hmm. so they could have their meetings and figure out what they were going to do we never knew you know we weren't allowed to go in there or anything mm -hmm. But it was exciting. Now, were you ever under any kind of siege or, or mortar attacks on these fire bases? Most of the time, when you when you go to a fire base, there usually can be pretty hot because Charlie definitely wants to get the fire base. That's given him a lot of problems, and they'll harass the hell out of you. We used to get uh, artillery. During the during uh, the operation uh, Dewey Canyon, we were, they went back into the Ashaw Valley, and they had a I don't know if it was a 122 millimeter uh, artillery piece that they were actually it was in like a cave. This is what we were told mm -hmm. it was in a cave and on sort of like railroad tracks, like tracks. And they would push it out, fire a few rounds at us, and then wheel it back in and camouflage it because they, this thing shot at us at least once a day, most of the times twice a day, mm -hmm. sometime in the morning and sometimes at night. But we had, we had a radio person that was uh, Vietnamese, and he was monitoring their radio, mm -hmm. so we knew. We knew when the gun was loading, so we had we had uh, you know an advance notice before this gun shot at us, mm -hmm. and everybody you know you yell to everybody incoming, you know what I mean, and you were able to take cover. But they were really bad shots. They either mm -hmm. fell way short or over the top of us. Mm -hmm. And when the rounds went over the top of us, they sounded like a freight train. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. What about? Uh Mortar attacks, were they fairly Mortars, accurate? Too. Well, we got hit one night when they tried to take the fire base and uh, made the, the Stars and Stripes in the other newspaper, which I can, can't off, offhand remember the name of. But uh, they said, like, there was like two or three hundred that tried to take us, mm -hmm. and we had at least 
I would say at least two companies of men, if not more. And you were involved us. in that? Yes. Where our, our fighting hole was in the center, mm -hmm. and we were surrounded by the grunts, thank God. But a mortar round came in. We were at the bottom of one of these places where they keep the, the artillery pieces were called parapets. Mm -hmm. And when this little bulldozer leveled it off, it, it left all soft dirt all the way around him. And <coughs> we took cover in our fighting hole, even though we were inside the perimeter, you know, we, they were sending in mortars. So we took cover and there was me and this other guy, his name, his last name was Hypes. And I can't remember his first name. But anyway, we took cover to see what was going on. And, and this was about three o'clock in the morning, by the way. And uh, a mortar round came in above us and hit in the soft sand. And when it exploded, it threw both of us down in the hole from the concussion. And we thought we were hit. So I said to Hypes, because I, I got a little bit of, of burning metal that went between my flak jacket mm -hmm. and it, it burnt me. And everybody told me when you get hit, it's a burning sensation. You know, so I said to Hypes, look at me. Look at me, man, am I hit? And he, and he like looks at me and he says, no, man, you're all right, am I all right? And I said, yeah, you're okay, we're good, you know? And I, it, it, it was just weird. Yeah. It was just strange, you know, never, never had that happen, you know, and uh, thank God we didn't get a scratch, but there was, uh, there was a few of our guys that, that got killed mm -hmm. on that hill, and there was, there was, I would say at least, right by our fighting hole, there was a, at least six or eight gooks that were, that were shot with a 50 caliber machine gun. We had a 50 caliber machine gun with us, mm -hmm. and uh, the grunts, nailed them and that's they were they weren't more than maybe 20 yards from our fighting hole mm -hmm. when they were killed wow. then they wanted us to search him and uh, we said we're helicopter support teams over here you mean yeah. search the bodies yeah know? yeah the grunts the, the one of the captain of the grunts or lieutenant went over and says oh you two guys search the bodies and we say we're helicopter support teams here so we got out of that. We didn't have to search the body, but they were looking for maps and yeah. stuff like that, you know. But it was kind of strange to not not to be morbid, but you know, you see people laid out in a funeral parlor. You know, they're all dressed nice and with their hands folded and whatnot. When people die in combat, they die in the position that they are when they stiffen up. And some some of them were up on one elbow. Some of them were. Uh, uh, on their on their side, holding, trying to support themselves with a hand from falling over or, or whatnot, and that's that's the way they died. And rigor mortis was starting to set in, so mm -hmm. you know that's just a thing of combat that gets imprinted in your mind, mm -hmm. and you can't forget it. Were were guys taking souvenirs like guns or? I didn't see anybody cutting anything. Right. You know, we, we heard these nasty stories about people cutting ears off right. and whatnot. No, there was none of that. Our officers wouldn't allow it. Right, but I mean like <laughs> picking up guns or belts yeah, if or there was, yes, helmets. And, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't. Some guys even took money. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the gooks had any money on them, they took it. But not our guys. Like I said, we were with the grunts. What the grunts yeah. did, you know, that was up to them. Yeah. But I didn't see anything... Uh, immoral going on or mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they were looking for information too. Sure. I mean, we got to give credit where it's due. Yeah. They had to go through their, their wallets to see if there was any kind of information in there that would be useful for us, you know, where they came from, where they were going, or, you know, any letters that they had written home or, or were going to mail or however they got their, their mail home, you know pictures, you know, mm -hmm. um, just anything that might be useful, maps. Yeah, they took, uh, you know, their, their rifles and stuff as souvenirs or, mm -hmm. you know, some of the stuff was taken back and confiscated and then looked at. 
if it was any kind of a new weapon or something they hadn't seen before. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> how long were you there be before they sent you back to Quang Tre? Three months. Three months? Yeah. As a matter of fact, we were there three months, and I have a picture of me and the two or three other guys that were on the that were on the fire base with us, that we went 37 days without a shower. Mm -hmm. And we were pretty grubby looking. Yeah. Now, when I say not a shower, I mean, I, I used to shave once in a while because I couldn't stand the beard. It was too hot over there. And it, it, it just made you feel a little bit more, more human. So if we had enough water, we, I usually shaved. You know, wipe my face and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But as far as changing clothes, I had a couple extra pairs of socks with me, but no extra trousers or or uh, shirts. Mm -hmm. So you know, it was the same clothes, and that was pretty rotten. Yeah. But everybody was in the same boat, so you know, you never you never really said, "Get away from me, you stink," or you yeah. know what I mean. It, everybody stunk, you know. Yeah. So. Okay, you must have been relieved to get off that fire base. Oh, big time. Mm -hmm. And uh, did did they send you on any sort of R and R at all, or? I I went on R and R after I was in country maybe seven eight months, and as it was, uh, I married my first wife. Notice I said my first wife. Mm -hmm. And. Her parents and my parents met me in Honolulu, mm -hmm. and that's where I took my R and R, and we got married there. Oh, okay. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, mm -hmm. but we got married there, and that was a big thrill. Yeah. yeah. The only bad part about that was they were going back to the world, and we were going. I was going back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. How long were you in Hawaii for? Five days. Five days. Yeah. Five days with white sheets, air conditioned, air conditioned rooms, and round eyed girls, and mm -hmm. hot food. It was amazing. It's, it was like you died and went to heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, did the Marine Corps frown on guys getting married like that when they went on their leave or R&R? &R? You didn't have any problems? Getting, they, a, getting a license or well, approval? You, you know, back then you had to have a blood test, mm -hmm. uh, VDRL, I think it was called. And um, no, it, it wasn't really hard. I think you had to fill out a form or two. Mm -hmm. And um, no, I, I, I can't say that they made it difficult. Mm -hmm. You just had to do it on your own time, of course. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you, when you had some free time, you know, when you came back off an operation, you could say, I need to go, you know, I got to do this or that, and they would give you time to do mm -hmm. it. So, no, I don't think it was too hard. I was able to do it. Yeah, I didn't have to, I think you had to have your your commanding officer's approval or something like that, but mm -hmm. no, there there didn't seem to be any problem. Okay, so, so you came back to Vietnam after getting married with approximately <clears throat> eight months in country. So were you in Vietnam for 12 months or 13 months with the Marines? Believe it or not, I was lucky enough to be in, in Vietnam for 11 months. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I was lucky enough to be there for 11 months was because when Johnson was president, he kept talking about withdrawing troops from Vietnam, but the person never did it. I'm not crazy about Johnson. Um, but when Nixon became president, not that he's my favorite president either, but when Nixon became president, he said he was going to withdraw troops and he kept his word. Mm -hmm. He withdrew the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, because I believe they were one of the first battalions in Vietnam. So he withdrew them. And at that particular time, I had gotten out of shore party engineer, and I had put in to go to military police on a whim. Mm -hmm. One of our, one or two of our guys had done it and got it, and I said, "Well, all they can say is no," and I put in for it, and I got it. Mm -hmm. 
So it was better duty than going out in the jungle, and that's all I really cared about. Uh -huh. And I had gotten that, so 1st Battalion, 9th Marines wasn't a full battalion. They had lost people from either going back to the world or gotten killed or wounded or whatever, so they needed X amount of people to fill out the battalion because they were going back to Okinawa. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they pulled short-timers from all over Vietnam area, in our area, and filled out the battalion with, with temporarily assigned duty, it was called, mm -hmm. TAD. And that, I was lucky enough to get picked. So if I could just back up for just sure. one minute, just before this happened, I got sick when I was in military police. I got a real, real high fever. Long story short, they put me on the hospital ship USS Sanctuary. They thought I had malaria. They kept testing me for it, but I didn't have it. When I went back, I spent a couple of weeks on the hospital ship, which was fantastic. Again, air conditioning and round-eyed nurses and good food and a movie every night and no duty, you know. So anyway, when I went back to my outfit, military police in Don Ha, <clears throat> I had orders waiting for me, and I reported to the lieutenant, and the lieutenant says, Phillips, you are the luckiest man in the world, and I said, how so, sir? And he says to me, you got orders to leave. I says, oh man, where are they putting me now? You know, he says, you're going back to the world. And I said, are you kidding me? And he says, no, I'm not. He says, here's your orders, good luck to you. I picked up my orders and I was sent to the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, which kind of sort of scared me because that was a grunt outfit. Yeah. And I said, well, and he says, don't get worried. He said, Nixon is withdrawing them. He said, you're going to fill out the battalion. You're going to Da Nang. You're going to get on a ship called the USS, or the USS Paul Revere and you're going to Okinawa. You're going to spend a month in Okinawa. He said, the, the grunts are going to retrain and be sent to some place in Japan for winter training, that real high mountain, and I can't, uh, Mount Fuji, mm -hmm. I think, or whatever, for, for winter training or something. He said, you won't have to do that because you're a short timer. He said, you're going to spend a month in Okinawa like you're on leave, mm -hmm. and he said, then you're going to go back to the world. And I said, that's fantastic. So that was really lucky for me. But then when I was on Okinawa waiting to go, a typhoon hit the island. I forget the name of the typhoon, but it had 115 mile an hour winds, and of course we were, you know, we couldn't leave the base or our, our hut that we were in, and that was just unbelievable. If you've never seen the wind blow at 115 miles an hour with gusting rain, you haven't lived. Mm -hmm. And we were there for three days. The storm hit the island, turned around, went back out to sea, turned around again and hit the island again. We didn't think we were ever going to leave. And that was tough because you were waiting to go home. Yeah. And then we finally got on a jet and flew back to California, Los Angeles. Now at that point when you arrived in the States, how much time did you have in the service? I had about, I think, I had about six months to do, mm -hmm. maybe a tad less, but someplace between five and say seven months, okay. some, some place in there. So I went home on leave for 30 days, I went back to Camp Lejeune, and I was put in a motor pool which I, I didn't have an MOS as a motor pool, mm -hmm. and I told them that, you know, I says, hey, I'm, you know, I can, I've done military police and I've done, you know, helicopter support teams in shore party engineers, and they said, nope, we need you in the motor pool, that's where you're going. So I went to the motor pool, picked up another MOS, and made uh, corporal, meritoriously. Now, what did they have you doing in the motor pool? I was changing oil. PM and Jeeps, greasing mm -hmm. them, simple stuff, mm -hmm. changing plugs, you know, stuff that, you know, you don't have to be mm -hmm. a brain surgeon to do. Now, did you have like a regular work day? Yeah. Like a nine to five job? Or? Well, it was more like uh, we fell out for muster. I think it was at 
7 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Then we had a report to our uh, workstations at by 8, mm -hmm. I think, and worked till, you know, I'm not really sure if it was 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, might have even been 5 o'clock. You, mm -hmm. you had your mess mess hall there, so you went for your, for your lunch there, and you had a, I guess it was an hour for lunch mm -hmm. or something. It was kind of like a work day. Now, where was your wife? Was she back home? or She was back home, and then after I was there for a short period of time, I said, well, I can get on base housing. They explained it to me, and it wasn't going to cost, I don't think it was going to cost me anything, or they took it out of my pay or mm -hmm. whatnot, so I had her come down, and she stayed the rest of the time with me. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you mentioned uh, in your application uh, about... Uh, most of the guys were from the south? A lot of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, and... Uh, Alabama, Carolinas, um, Florida, um, Louisiana, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much deep south. Mm -hmm. How were race <clears throat> relations? Very bad. Was this stateside or in Vietnam? Both. Vietnam was very bad. As a matter of fact, when I was in Vietnam, I was chosen to be on a sort of kind of a race relations kind of thing because we had a lot of trouble in country with black and white relations. Mm -hmm. And what they decided to do was to get X amount of blacks, maybe three or four, and X amount of whites and sit down with an officer and sort of try to hash different problems out. You know, uh, you do this and this offends us and we do this and that offends them mm -hmm. and we try to try to iron our problems out instead of, you know, taking it out on each other with fist fights and, and guns and mm -hmm. knives and uh, just being rotten to each other. Were those sit-down <clears throat> talks uh, successful? Somewhat. Mm -hmm. Somewhat. Some white people will never fall in love with black people and some black people will never fall in love with white people. Mm -hmm. You can talk to your blue in the face, but for the most part you, you did air some things that were causing a lot of problems. Um, I don't know if you want to get into that, but um, just, you know, okay. I'm white and this bothers me because you, you're, you're black and you do this and mm -hmm. black people would say the opposite. Okay. You know? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> so you spent the rest of your time at, at Lejeune? Camp Lejeune, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, well, I'm just uh, just looking here. You mentioned uh, uh, on Firebase Cunningham about a helicopter exploding. Yes. Do you, Do you want to tell us how how that came about? Okay, what, what happened? I, I was telling you the firebase that we spent 37 days on without a bath. Mm -hmm. That was LZ Cunningham. Okay. And that was also the base that got hit. And uh, at this particular, before we got, I believe it was before we got hit, this chopper came in. Uh, it was uh, Huey, I think. And was it a Marine helicopter? I believe it was. Mm -hmm. I believe it was. And, you know, they, they normally come with pilot, co pilot, and a gunner, usually, or, or usually three, the crew chief, thank yeah. you. And, um, he, he came in, and at that particular time, I was away from the landing zone, maybe maybe 50 yards or better away. I don't know what I was doing, but I wasn't right there. Somebody else was bringing the chopper in, because we used to have to, you know, direct him and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And um, must have been a mortar round, because the chopper's running. You know, they used to keep their engines yep. running, you know, so it makes a lot of noise, but it must have been a mortar round because we heard it explode, it was kind of muffled, and next thing we knew, the chopper caught fire, and they go, they're made of magnesium and another 
metal, and once they start to burn, it's like flare, and there's no putting them out. And uh, uh, they were all killed, pilot, co-pilot, and crew chief. And then naturally, they were burned to death. Mm -hmm. I don't know if some of the shrapnel might have gotten them, but the crew chief was blown in uh, two pieces. Mm -hmm. And we had to wrap him up in a, in a poncho. And then on a, we had a stretcher, and we had to put him on the stretcher and tie him with combat wire to keep him from blowing away when the, when the next chopper came in to medevac him out, mm -hmm. plus the other, two, the other two guys. And that was pretty, pretty yeah. gruesome. Okay, and uh, once once you uh, were discharged, or before you were discharged, did you consider uh, re-enlisting at all, or making the Marine Corps a career? I did. I I um, I happened to like when I came back to the states. They put me in a motor pool, mm -hmm. as I said. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And I happened to have a commanding officer in the motor pool who was a captain, and he was from the deep south, but he was, uh, he wasn't what you would call a good old boy. He was a very fair man. He didn't care where you were from, he didn't care what color you were. As long as you did your job and did what you were told, he, he, he was good to you. Mm -hmm. If you didn't, he could be pretty miserable to you. Mm -hmm. You were the one, if you messed up, you were the one that went to mess duty or guard duty or whatever else bad had to be done. You know? uh -huh. And uh, he came out and said to me when I had maybe, maybe a month or two to go, he came out and said to me, Phillips, he says, how long have you been in this Marine Corps? And I told him, you know, less than two years. And he says, uh, this is after he made me corporal. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, you ever think about staying in? I said, yes, sir. And he says, uh, well, why don't you give it some thought? And I said, he said, well, what's stopping you from staying in? And I said, well, to be honest with you, sir, the thing that's stopping me is that not everybody is like you as far as commanding officers. I said, I've had some bad ones. Mm -hmm. I says. I'm getting out, and I'm not trying to butter you up, but I said, I think you're a decent officer. He said, thank you. And I said, if I could be guaranteed that I could have a decent officer, I might think about it. He said, you know, he said, we'll make you a sergeant. And I said, I, I appreciate that. You know, I appreciated mm -hmm. that, but he, he couldn't talk me into it. Mm -hmm. But I, I had thought about it, but I didn't think it was anything any kind of a life for a guy mm -hmm. that was married. Yeah, what did your wife think of the military? Um, she didn't seem to mind it. Mm -hmm. um, she, I think if I wanted to stay in, she, she would have stayed in, but I don't think it would have worked out for us because we were having trouble then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the more I stayed away, I think maybe she was happier because we weren't getting along that well, you know? Okay. So um, I, I think everything worked out for the best. All right, once you were discharged, you were discharged out of Lejeune, mm -hmm. and then you, you came back to uh, this area? Saratoga. Okay, and uh, did you go on to school, or, or did you take a job? I came back to Saratoga, and at that particular time, my wife was working for the state and she told me I was looking for a job then I was an off, I was offered a couple of jobs with through the military or through the, the VA mm -hmm. and uh, one of them was working with the uh, uh, railroad which I wasn't crazy about mm -hmm. so I didn't even look into that I had to go down to Selkirk I think it was or whatever but I wasn't mm -hmm. crazy about it and, didn't think it was going to be my cup of tea, so I didn't even look into it. But my ex-wife told me that, that they were looking for temporary help during the tax season. And what you do is you go to work and you, you, there's a number that has to be placed 
on everybody's income tax return at that time, and it had to be hand stamped. So, they and it paid well, and you got benefits, mm -hmm. and um, it was a good way to start. And mm -hmm. she figured you could get your foot in the door anyway, and maybe take some tests. So, long story short, that's what I did. I worked there, and I ended up. They kept me on longer. Mm -hmm. it, it, the people that they liked, they kept on longer as long as they could. And then I took an exam, and I, and I ended up becoming a meat inspector for the state. And um, I worked as a meat inspector, and then I changed to a food inspector for 38 years for the mm -hmm. state. So that worked out well. Okay. And when did you retire? I retired about five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, 2004, around there. Okay. okay. And uh, did you join any veterans organizations? Um, no. I, I, I go to the VA mm -hmm. because while I was in, in Vietnam, I was exposed to Agent Orange and I ended up getting diabetes. Diabetes is not in my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get a disability from, from the VA for that. And I also picked up PTSD, and I get also get a disability for that, so I get that taken care of by the VA. Mm -hmm. And um, I joined the Elks, and we do volunteer work for them. My wife, both my wife and I, I'm an Elk, she's not, but mm -hmm. she works with me, volunteering for cerebral palsy and whatnot. That's not a, a veteran's kind of thing, but mm -hmm. I do. They do good things for a lot of people. Okay. Um, now this is your second wife. Yes. W when did you uh, remarry? 1977. Okay. Yeah, and we've been married for 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. I think it's 31 or 32. <laughs> Any children? No children. No. Okay. I also got another gift from Vietnam. Uh, I'm basically sterile. Uh, didn't know that, wish I knew it when I was 15, but um, I've, I've got sperm, but they're not modal, they don't move. Okay. So, and dioxin is an extremely strong chemical agent, mm -hmm. which was used, one of the chemicals used in Agent Orange, and it can cause sterility, but the VA does not recognize that at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you stay in contact with anyone you served with at all? Yes. There was a guy by the name of Randy Phillips, which is, he has the same last name as me. He was from Falmouth, Maine. And we, we were, he came back to the States. We were in the same outfit. When I was in the motor pool at Camp Lejeune, he was, he was in supply, in our supply unit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we're very close friends when we were in Vietnam. We were close friends in Lejeune. When we got out, we kept, kept, I kept in contact with him a couple of times, but the friendship wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just was not the same. He was a different person, and I probably was too. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just, we never kept in contact after a couple of times. Okay. I think you alluded uh, partially to this, but uh, how do you think your time in the service uh, changed or affected your life? Boy, that's a deep question. It made me, it definitely made me appreciate life. Mm -hmm. It made me appreciate what a great country this is, not that we're perfect. We're far from perfect, but mm -hmm. if you see the way other people live in this world, and then you know how you live, we don't have it bad at all. Mm -hmm. We don't have it bad. We got it made. Um, what other people have to do to make a living in other countries, I mean, those people have to work. I mean, sweat. Mm -hmm. Working in a rice field is not fun. You know, having goats and chickens and, and 
water buffalo, you know, as far as not, not usually not having a car or maybe a motorcycle if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. And putting up with the climates that they put up with and uh, just medical care that they don't have or very little. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's phenomenal here to live in this country. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything uh, else that uh, you'd like to talk about? Maybe we we missed or anything you want to touch on at all? Any other incidents that you experienced? I would, I would say that probably the war, the way the war was handled was very uh, disturbing mm -hmm. to me. I mean, this, this bit about, you know, you take a piece of ground and then, then you leave and lose it. Uh, you couldn't bomb this place and you couldn't bomb the, these people and you couldn't, you couldn't go into Cambodia, you couldn't go into Laos and that's where they, all the gooks were coming through there and they, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you, we, but we couldn't go in there. We're always too much under the magnifying glass, you know? And the, the enemy can always do anything he or she wants to do. We're not allowed to. We're the ones that have to go by the rules. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a very discouraging thing when you're in combat. Because mm -hmm. most of the guys that I knew wanted to jo all join hands at the DMZ and just walk north and let happen whatever was going to happen, but take all of our firepower with us and use it. Mm -hmm. But we weren't, you know, we were afraid of China, we were afraid of Russia. We didn't bomb, want to bomb Haiphong Harbor where all the ships were coming in with all their ammunition and all their, their guns and, and, you know, vehicles and everything else that were used against us for fear that we should bomb one of the Russians' mm -hmm. ships and get them into it. So, you know, again, we always have to play by the rules. Mm -hmm. They don't have to. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. You're welcome.